Good morning again. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is such a, an incredible blessing to kids literally around the world. And I want to say a special thank you to Sue Klaus. She was in the early service, but she has headed that up for us. And this is the last week to turn in your boxes. Next Sunday, we'll be collecting them for the final time. You can bring them all week long, or you can bring them next Sunday, and we'll get those out and literally around the world for you. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, or maybe you have your uh, devices with you, um, and you can look it up on, uh, on your uh, digital device, or we'll show uh, some notes up here on the uh, on the screen also, but Ephesians chapter four and verse 29. Before I get started, I need to say welcome. Lori's cousin Ray and her family are here. Would you just wave your hand, Ray? Did we separate your family? Is that, did we not have enough room? I am so sorry. Okay, people, make room next week for guests, okay? Um, But welcome, it's great to have you here. We love you guys. Um, uh, Yeah, your Bibles, Ephesians chapter four, verse 29. Let's take a look. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. But only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment so that you will give grace to those who hear. Let me read that again. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification or for building up according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Several hundred years earlier, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes A similar verse when he said, words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious. Words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious while the lips of a fool consume him. Heavenly Father, we pray that today you would take your word and uh, empower it by your spirit and that you would transform us. Lord, as we head into the to the holidays, I pray again, God, that you would help us to be your representatives in in our families and in other activities that we'll be part of. God, help us to represent you well. Help us to be an impact and an influence for you. Empower us today by your spirit to that end. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. So we're heading into the holidays, right? I don't know how many, does anybody have the days counted to uh, uh, Christmas? Anybody? Uh, 42? Yeah, it's, it's the young people that are, that are calling these out. The, are there any, okay, there was one person in the early service. Has anybody completed all of your holiday shopping already? Okay, is there anybody in the room who shops like starting December 23rd? Okay, you are my people right there, yes. Yeah, it's, it's more exciting, right? When you do it last minute, it's just more exciting. It has nothing to do with procrastination. <laughs> Oh man, as we, as we head into the holiday, some of you are really looking forward to time with, with family. Uh, some maybe are struggling because you'd like to be with family, but it's not an opportunity for you this year because of schedules or location or whatever the case might be. Some in the room might be heading uh, toward the holidays and, and dreading time with family because of the difficulties and the challenges that, uh, that can be part of that. Some may have talked to somebody between the uh, services and they said they have a family member who anticipates this wonderful time and every year is disappointed because it never turns out exactly like they had had planned it. And some of you may have, have experienced that. The holidays can be, can be stressful. And whether we're surviving or whether we're enjoying the holidays, our holidays as believers have a purpose. Your life has a purpose. And your life has a purpose during the holidays. God has us on assignment during the holidays to impact the lives of people in the way that Jesus would impact them. He's got a purpose for us, not just to survive the holidays, but to really have an impact. And Jesus, if you think about it, Jesus impacted with grace and truth. He impacted others with grace and with truth. Here's the idea this morning, that truth travels best over the bridge of relationship. Can I say that again? Truth travels best over the bridge of relationship. If there's anybody in the room who's ever had a little one and maybe they threw a fit at at, uh, one of those inopportune times, maybe you're checking out at the store and your child is the one, all the others are behaving properly, but yours is the one that's 
just having one of those moments. And, and uh, I don't know whether you've ever experienced this, but uh, sometimes your child throws the fit and then there's a person who feels obligated to tell you, train you in parenting skills. Has anybody ever experienced that one? It's like, okay, my, my day is not going well already, but now you're... And what do you think when that happens? You, you, you ask yourself the question. Maybe you ask them, who are you? Who are you to tell me how to... You don't know my child. You don't know my situation. You don't know that you know, they threw up on the way to the store. and you, you don't know. You feel like they don't have a right to speak into your situation. Why? Because they don't have a relationship with you. Now, if somebody had a relationship, you might still feel the same way. But... But there's that relational issue. And I would submit to you this morning that truth travels best over the bridge of relationship. I hope you have a friend in your life or a family member that can just tell you the truth and they don't need to explain themselves they, because there's relationship there and they can speak truth into your life. So the question we have to ask ourselves in all of our interactions is, is, is my relationship strong enough to bear the weight of the truth that I'm sharing? Is my relationship strong enough to bear the weight of the truth that I'm sharing. And one way that we build a strong bridge of relationship is through gracious speech. We said that Jesus brought grace and truth. It's through gracious speech. Uh, this is going to make me sound really smart, so that's why I'm sharing it. Uh, Vine's Expository Dictionary of Biblical Words says this. Um, that was the smart part. Uh, but it says, the word gracious in the New Testament, the word gracious means that which, I love this, that which causes pleasure, delight, or favorable regard. Being gracious is, is that which, which they use the word occasions, which occasions pleasure or delight or favorable regard. Gracious, here's, here's what I'd submit to you this morning. Gracious speech builds favorable regard. Gracious speech builds favorable regard. It builds relationship. It's the model of Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, the scripture says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of, watch these words, full of what? Grace and truth. And that's exactly what we're talking about this morning. So, so Jesus spoke words of grace and truth. So how do we develop gracious speech? I'm so glad you asked because if you hadn't, we'd stop right here. Uh, how do we develop gracious speech? I wanna talk about that this morning. As we're headed into the holidays and as we have these opportunities that sometimes just come past us once a year, how do we develop, how do we speak graciously to other people. What does that mean? And what does the Bible have to say about that? We're going to look at the book of Proverbs. And so we'll be uh, talking about a number of scriptures, but we're going to try to, to, to understand more fully what it means to speak with grace. So the first thing I notice in the scripture, it's a biblical principle. Just because I think I'm right, doesn't mean I'm right. Just because I think I'm right, it doesn't mean I'm right. So, uh, People who, ha who were born in the last, I don't know, 10 years, sociologists are saying that their, their biblical, na or their biblical, their digital natives, their digital natives, that if, if you're 10 years old, you've never known the world without Facebook. Now, uh, yeah, wow. Well, uh, uh, some of us are a little older than that. So we have some perspective. We've known the world without Facebook. We've known the world without digital media. And, and with that perspective, you can kind of analyze what, what's taken place. And I think all of us would agree that our world has changed pretty significantly because of social media. What I've noticed in the world is that, that we're more prone to offer strongly stated, often uninformed opinions about inconsequential topics. Can I say that again? We're more prone because of, I think, social media to offer strongly stated, often uninformed opinions about inconsequential topics. Let me give you an example. Cinnamon rolls are the best food on planet Earth and anyone who doesn't think so is brain dead and doesn't deserve to be my friend. <laughs> and you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
there's an amen. I, I knew that I chose the wrong thing because probably all of us agree with that statement. But, uh, but you've read things like that on social media. Things that are inconsequential, but they're dividing lines. And what happens is it, it's like we're, we're, we're lobbing verbal hand grenades at each other over some digital wall. And that attitude has impacted our government. And I believe it's, it's finding its way into the church. It's not grace-filled. But it, it's almost like we've, we've gotten to a place in our culture, I think I've said this before, but it's almost like we've gotten to a place in our culture where we say, hi, my name's Tom, which side are you on? And if we're dividing ourselves, if we're dividing ourselves politically, if, if, if we're dividing, if, if, if we're focused on division, it takes whole swaths of people out of our reach as believers. And sometimes our opinions are not correct or they don't apply to other people simply because I think something doesn't make it so. And the corollary is that those around me are not required to agree with me. <laughs> those around me are not required to agree with me. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2 says, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. What's happening right now digitally is that uh, we're, we're hearing people now talking about the digital Babylon, that, that uh, there's almost an exile that's taking place uh, digitally. But with the algorithms that are uh, part of all of our social media, they feed us things that we already agree with. And so we stop talking as much to people that disagree with us, and all of our opinions are bolstered by those that do agree with us. And that's not a very healthy place to live. And it's, I think, causing more and more division rather than more and more grace. So I need to remind myself, I don't know everything. And until I have all knowledge, I should probably hold my opinions loosely. Just because I think I'm right doesn't mean I'm right. And the second thing, and again, as we head into the holidays, we have these opportunities. The second truth I want to focus on is not just, just because I think I'm right doesn't mean I'm right, but the second truth is just because I'm right doesn't mean I need to say it. I'll just wait for an amen whenever you... Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 27, actually 28 is my favorite, one of my favorite verses, but Proverbs 17 verse 27 says, he who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding or a woman of understanding. Verse 28, I love this. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's considered prudent. Gang, listen, this will help you at your next family gathering. <laughs> you, may, you may be thinking... You may be thinking this thought, my brother-in-law just said the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Even if you think that, don't say it out loud. <laughs> just because you think it doesn't mean you need to say it. And listen, here, here's, the, here's the great thing about this. If you simply remain silent and listen, people will think you're smarter than you are. It's to our advantage. It's an awesome gift. I don't know whether you've read the book, The Charisma Myth, uh, by Olivia Fox Cabane, but she writes this story about Benjamin Disraeli and William Gladstone, who were competing to be elected as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And uh, everybody was in agreement that Gladstone was probably the smartest man in the UK. Uh, somebody wrote about him and said he knew most things about everything. <laughs> He was just a brilliant man and he had uh, studied very, very well. Uh, he was probably the smartest man in the UK, but he wasn't elected, Disraeli was elected. And so a journalist was kind of following up the election and trying to research as to why Benjamin Disraeli would have been elected when Gladstone actually was the smarter of the two. 
And he discovered that it might have been explained by uh, Jenny Jerome, who was Winston Churchill's mother. And Jerome had had a meal a week prior to the election with both of the men. And so the journalist asked her what her impression was of, the, of these two men, Benjamin Disraeli and William Gladstone. She said, when I left the dining room after sitting next to Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in England. But when I sat next to Disraeli, I left feeling that I was the cleverest woman. They said, what happened? She said, Disraeli just asked me questions about my life and listened intently for the rest of the evening. And I thought, you know, Benjamin Disraeli discovered a biblical principle that to build relationships, we have to listen. We listen to other people. We build that relational bridge. So we've said it earlier, just because I think it's right doesn't make it right. And the corollary, corollary to that is just because I know it, I don't have to say it. The third thing that I think can help us from the book of Proverbs is this truth. When I say it, I need to say it with kindness. When I say it, I need to say it with kindness. Last night we were watching a, a football game for a little bit. And uh, uh, the commercials uh, came on for sitcoms. And, you know, they, they do the highlights. They do the funniest piece of the sitcom. That's what they try to do to catch your attention. And in both of these highlights of the sitcoms, they had people sitting at tables calling each other names. I thought, that's what our humors come to. We need, we need to learn how to say things kindly to people. Um, so here's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 15 and verse 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Watch this. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. Let me say that again. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable but the mouth of fools spouts folly. As, as Christ followers, as God's children, I would love to see us um, start a revolution. When I leave in the morning, a lot of times I'll give Lori a kiss and say, I'll see you later. I'm going out to try to change the world, <laughs> which is a little grandiose. I realize uh, <laughs> crazy people say that, but, but I, I think we really could. Maybe we could start something here as Christ followers, that, that we would lead the way in civil conversations. That we'd ask God to help us respect every person that we meet. Maybe you're saying, you know, some people that I meet don't deserve respect. Well, stop for just a moment and realize with me that, that for the rest of our lives, we will never set eyes on a person who is not a creation of God. In other words, every person that we'll see until we die has been created by God. He's intimately known by God. She's intimately known by God and loved infinitely by God. So the people we talk to do deserve our respect. Out of honor to the Lord, they deserve our respect. And you know, it's tempting to think that, that strong words will change someone's mind. But stop and think about that for just a moment. Have you ever had somebody speak really strong words to you and, and your in, immediate response is, thanks, I really needed to hear that? Usually, especially if they disagree with us. Now, if they say something really strongly and you agree with it, you're like, yeah, amen. But if they say something that's maybe corrective and they say it really strongly, the, the stronger they say it, the harder it is to receive. And again, I, I think that's happening in our culture. What happens is that often strong words actually weaken relationships. Proverbs 16 and verse 21 says, the wise in heart will be called understanding and here it is, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Sweetness of speech 
increases persuasiveness. Right now, as a, as a culture, we are racing fast to the bottom. And it's the louder and louder and louder we speak, and we've started in this downward spiral, and the, the more coarse our conversation, and the, the meaner our words, and, and the more disrespectful, it just seems like there's this, this process that we're, that we're involved in as, as a culture. And somebody has to stop it, and, and if it's not us as the church, who's gonna stop it? Who's gonna reverse the trend? It's, it's incumbent upon us. Kind words can bring life and build relationships. In fact, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24 says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. James chapter one and verse 19 says, this you know, my beloved brethren. By the way, this will help you in the holidays. It'll help you in relationships. It'll help you at work. It'll help you with your spouse. It, it's... I'll tell you, the Bible is an amazing book. When you latch onto a truth in the scripture, it affects everything. But James says this, James 1, verse 19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Tim Elmore in his book, Soul Provider, which is out of print, and it's a travesty that is out of print. It's very hard to get. You might be able to find it on Amazon, I'm not sure. But the author's Tim Elmore. The book is called Soul Provider. And it's a fascinating book to me because he had a young man who was preparing to get engaged. And when he uh, uh, came to Tim, Tim said, well, if you're going to get married, you need to understand that you need to be the spiritual leader in your home. And the young man looked back at him and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He, he had given his life to Christ, but he, didn't, he had never heard about this idea of being a spiritual leader. And so Tim realized that he was expecting this young man to do something he didn't know what it was. It hadn't, hadn't been described to him. So he wrote a book, actually, and the book is based on his counsel for this young man as to how to be a spiritual leader. It's a fascinating, fascinating take. But one of the things, I'll save you the money and, and time looking for the book. The best thing in the book is this, that he has a chapter that's, that's devoted to hosting relationships, hosting relationships. Tim came up with, with the, the, that, that, coined that phrase, but it's a great phrase. It's a little bit like, you know, if you have somebody in your home, how do you treat somebody in, in your home? Well, you, you, you're concerned about them. You know, if, if, uh, if Lori and I have someone in our home, uh, every night, almost every night, it's a rare exception. I have a bowl of cereal. Just before we go to bed, uh, I have a bowl of cereal. Now, if you came to, and with, with Lori, Lori's not offended by that. Um, I don't think, I've never asked, but uh, she's not offended by that. She's saying no. Um, so I, I just go into the kitchen, I fix myself a bowl of cereal, I come back out in the living room, eat it, try not to spill on the couch. That's what I do. So, um, but if, if, if you were, uh, a new guest, first time guest in my home, and you were sitting on the sofa, and all of a sudden, without any announcement, nothing, I just leave, walk into the kitchen, grab a bowl, fill it with cereal, come back out, start eating in front of you, you would think, wow, he's not a very good host. Because when we're hosting, we think differently. And I think as we mature spiritually, we need to learn how to host relationships. When you're a host, what do you do? You're more concerned about your guest than you are about yourself. If your guest says, boy, it's really warm in here and I'm freezing to death, I'm gonna adjust the temperature to make them comfortable. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna make sure that, you know, uh, uh, the food gets passed to them. All, all those things. You, I'm, I'm trying to think of examples of being a host. I'm realizing I'm not that good of a host. But uh, Lori is an outstanding host, so I just do what she does. But, uh, uh, but there's this truth of, of spiritual growth. If we're growing in the Lord, we begin to host relationships. We put the needs of the other person before our own. And we're constantly thinking... 
if I say this, how does this sound to them? And if I were in their position, how would I, how would I respond to that? You know, it, it, it's a little bit like, uh, as a parent, there, there's a huge temptation to ask questions that, that there's no good response for. For instance, the parental question, <laughs> what were you thinking? There's not a good answer to that. You can answer, I wasn't. And then your parent says, I know. Or you could say, well, I was thinking. And they say, don't talk back to me. There's no good answer to what were you thinking. And sometimes uh, it, it's just incumbent upon us. I, not sometimes. It's incumbent upon us as spiritual leaders as we're growing in the Lord and, and we're maturing in the Lord. One of the signs of that is that we host relationships and we're really concerned about how things impact the people around us because we realize that we're envoys of Christ in those situations. We place the needs of other people ahead of our own. So what if we started a revolution this holiday season? What, what if we reverse the cultural trend? We may not affect the United States. We might not even affect Southeast Kansas. But it reminds me of the story of the little guy who was walking down the shore, picking up starfish and throwing them back into the ocean. And there were thousands of starfish that had washed up. An older man looked at him and said, son, what are you doing? You can't have a huge impact. You're not making any difference. And the little boy picked up a starfish and tossed him into the ocean. He said, I'm making a difference for that one. We may not change the culture around us, but, but we can change the lives of people around us. What if we reversed the culture? What if we reversed the culture, maybe in our family, maybe in our workplace? And what if we regained the church's reputation? A reputation that's widely been lost. But what if we regained the church's reputation for kindness and concern? Because right now, when people look at us and we invite them to church, they... They have an opinion of us, right, wrong, or indifferent, I don't know, but they have an opinion of us that we're just like the rest of the world. We're just harsh about different things. What if we regain the church's reputation for kindness and concern? You know, we can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, allowing God to heal our lives. You know, uh, if we're hurting, we hurt other people. That's just the way that it works. Hurting people hurt people. But if, if we allow the Holy Spirit to begin to do something inside of us and heal up the hurts, maybe you've got relational hurt, maybe, uh, maybe you're saying, you know, you just can't trust people, maybe, maybe there's, there's hurt in your background, and I, I get that, but so maybe you're saying, man, I don't, I don't know that I've even got the goods to do this. If we do, it's the power of the Holy Spirit working through us, and we need His empowering, Right? We need him to help us. So this morning, my prayer is that God would do something inside of us that would be healing and life-giving so that we can extend that life-giving relational ability, words of grace to those around us so that their lives would be changed. And who knows where that revolution might end. Would you stand with me? Let's pray.